we've just started uh, the recording of the particular presentation. So this will be made available to you folks in a while, and I'll shortly introduce uh, David. And what we'll do is we'll follow up this then for the teachers uh, with a copy of the special presentation slides so you can show it to your students uh, during class time. We'll give you the actual special topic handout as well. That's all the supplemental information that will help you understand the special topic that we have for the Leave Insert. And of course, we'll send you the link for the recording. Okay, so without further ado, I'll uh, pass you over to David McInerney and some of the teachers would have met David from being in here on the Thursday and during school visits. All right, how's everybody doing? Good, okay. Um, I can't hear people if I was meant to, but that might be okay. Um, all right, so the... This small box is a little bit smaller than I'm used to here. Um, I have some stuff over here that you can't see. I'll try and bring it forward near the end and I have a few other bits and pieces as well. We'll do our best to, as I said, try and lift it in front of the camera and demonstrate it to you. But for, for the most part, we're gonna just have to cover what's in the presentation. And as I said, I'll do my best to describe the in-person stuff as I can. Um, yeah. So if everybody's ready then, I will uh, start the sharing of that guy. Um, so here. Uh, sorry, two seconds. That's weird. Okay. Yep. Uh, desktop, desktop window. Fine. Uh, again, I should be able to. Yeah, I don't know. Share. And. Okay. So two seconds now, and I'll, I'll get started. Do you see any of the, like, have you any access? Because I can't see anything now. I can't see any chat. I can't see any. Yeah, if you could join the meeting on your phone, then you could notify me of anything. Because as I said, if it's if it's in that full screen, I can't. I have no other screen to see anything else. I can't see any of the classes. I can't see reactions. Um, I'm talking to just my own presentation. Um, OK, so just bear with me one second. Uh, I'm going to see if I might be able to share the presentation in a way that I can still see the meeting. Bear with me now. Sorry, sorry about this, lads. Two seconds. Um, sharing. Share. PowerPoint. Yeah, no, I've got to do it that way. Okay, we got to go this way, folks, which is fine. Um, it's just uh, just to note now. I suppose I can't I can't see anybody at the moment, so I'll try and I'll try and keep my my, my focus on the screen. Um, but just bear in mind, I can see. However, Owen will I'm assuming shout at me if there's if there's something I need to know. Okay, so with that in mind, let's try and um, let's try and kick off some of it. I'm also not used to having the the cable for the mic here, so I'm probably going to trip over it at some stage. Um, but so we'll see how we get on. So. Um, as I said, this is a presentation around the special topic in um, engineering for the Leaving Source this year, which is around artificial intelligence in smart manufacturing. Now, I do have the exact uh, the exact quote in, in a few slides, and once we've got a bit of a better idea of what we're talking about with the artificial intelligence in smart manufacturing, then I'll present us with that exact quote, and then we'll have some more slides to relate to that later on. So basically, the, the influence of um, artificial intelligence in smart manufacturing is, is growing rapidly at the moment. It's, it's been growing for a while, and it's going to continue to grow um, into the future. Uh, artificial intelligence, according to the ARC advisory group, applies to any uh, device that perceives its environment and then takes actions to maximize its chance of success towards some goal. Now, that is um, artificial intelligence, I suppose, in a very, very, very loose sense. Um, when you often people, when they're referring to artificial intelligence, refer to a tighter group of artificial intelligence where you will be talking about um, the machine having the ability to uh, um, learn from, from previous iterations or previous instances of it um, encountering a situation. But I'll, um, I'll split those two up in a moment as we get down closer to them. Uh, then the, as I said, the AI here, it does include a vast range of technologies. So we do have stuff like, as I said, as, as uh, traditional based uh, rules and logic systems. So you're talking about kind of if then, or if this, then that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And then that is enabling uh, computers to solve problems in a way that at least superficially seems um, seems like thinking. So as I said, it might not necessarily be thinking, but it at least superficially looks that way. Um, 
So there have basically been four industrial revolutions, of which we're in the middle of the first one at the moment. Um, uh, sorry, the fourth one at the moment. Um, and the first one, the industrial uh, Industrial Revolution 1.0 would have started back around the 1970s uh, with the mechanization and the introduction of steam and water power. So um, prior to, we'll say prior to introducing these things, the only things uh, work-wise, and I mean work in the in the physics sense, um, the only things work-wise that humans would have been able to produce were whatever our muscles were able to do, or perhaps we um, enlisted horses or, or oxes or something like that in order to be able to provide some power for us as well. But but that was as much power as we could produce. Then we um, got the introduction of the uh, steam engine, and now all of a sudden we were able to produce machines that could um, in, uh, add massive amounts of uh, extra work to a system without needing to you know have the, the muscles there to compete in that sense um following from from that then we moved into uh industry 2.0 around the 1870s which about 100 years later um when we ended up with uh, mass production assembly lines uh using electrical power systems and stuff like that and one of the, the bigger examples i use of this is uh henry ford and the uh, conveyor system for the assembly line system for producing for motor vehicles. Um, now, uh, I suppose, take with me for a minute, if we were to step back to the 1770s and imagine a, a car, now I know we didn't have cars in the 70s, let's say, I don't know, it was uh, some sort of a cart instead. But again, just for the, the analogy, let's imagine we're in the 1970s and we're adding a door handle to a car. So that is our job. If we have a warehouse or a factory full of cars, then what we end up having is I need to place down my tools, get ready to do the job. I need to put the door handle into the car. Then when I'm done, which is a small enough job, then I pick up all my tools again and I have to move to the next situation. And then I have to go ahead and take my tools out again, set them back up again, put the new door handle on the car, tidy up my tools, collect them, move on to the next situation, whatever have you. Obviously, this isn't terribly efficient. And this is what um, Henry Ford was capitalizing on when he introduced the assembly lines. Now, instead of everybody picking up their tools and moving to the next job, the job came to them. So we have the cars on the assembly line. And instead of, as I said, me picking up my tools each time, now as the worker, I just stand here. I'm ready with my tools. Everything's all laid out. Everything's exactly the way I want it to be. And then the cars come along. I attach the handle, car moves out of the way, new handle comes in. So that would have been bringing about the Industrial Revolution 2.0, as I said, which is when we had these ideas of assembly lines and stuff like that. As we continue to, to progress with these, then obviously they brought down untold advantages, huge savings. Everybody started to get quite interested in doing this. And then we started to introduce um, automated production systems, computers uh, for for completing some of these tasks and just IT systems and robotics in general. So around the 1970s, again, another 100 years on, we had this um, industry 3.0, which is where companies and um, employers realized that, well, now I have the employee that stands here in the one place. And what they're doing is they're going in there putting a door handle in the door. If I now have a machine to do that for me, so if I get some sort of a mechanized machine or a robot arm that can just repeat this same, like it's a very repetitive task, just car comes in on the conveyor belt, I attach a door handle, I remove my, my mechanism or whatever have you, and then the car moves on again. So they started to replace the people doing this with machines, which could do it much more precisely, get the, you know, the exact same point on the exact same position of the car every single time because of the reproduce, repu excuse me, reproducibility of machines. And with that then, as I said, you end up with just being able to complete a massively or a, a much greater amount of work in a shorter period of time. Um, that was all well and good then, but there was still some issues with this industry 3.0 idea in the fact that we could end up in the situation where you have something going wrong, like a conveyor belt doesn't have a vehicle on it and pulls up. Well, the old systems are still going to try and attach that door handle into the car when it's there, or God forbid now, generally in these robotic areas, they'll be fenced off and you won't have people in there. But if somebody got in the way and the robot arm is in the middle of trying to attach a door handle to the door, if there's a person in the way and the robot doesn't know about it, it's going to continue trying to attach the door handle to the door. And that would obviously be detrimental for whoever's there. So with the industry um, 4.0, smart factories were introduced this idea of our autonomous systems now have sensors they can be aware of the world around them they can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to make decisions on should i actually extend my arm out and attach this handle to the door you know so the conveyor belt has moved on there was no car there machine goes to do it and then stops and says no some sensor is telling me there's no car there on that on that system so instead i won't go ahead and i won't go and try and attach door handle to it so that's kind of the, the four um, industrial revolutions we're looking at
So according then to Accenture um, Artificial Intelligence Report, corporate profits could increase by an average of about 38% uh, by 3035, in large part thanks to more advanced um, artificial, um, sorry, more advanced deployment of artificial intelligence into financial, IT, manufacturing, um, the medical industries, all of these industries could literally see massive increase in profits due to adoption of these systems. But at the early stage of AI implementation, it's not clear how it will be deployed across um, many uh, possible use cases. And the problem you have is that at this stage, the risk reward scenarios are being evaluated. And for smaller companies, it might be just too much of a risk or too much of a leap to take to go forward. Whereas you have the big giants like um, Microsoft, uh, Google, Apple, Amazon, these guys that would be investing hugely in um, software AI and stuff like that. And they can afford to have a problem go wrong and still come back and carry on with their business later on. Whereas the smaller guys would need everything to work for them. So likelihood is the bigger players will get introduced into the technology first, and then that will be followed up by the smaller players later on down the road. So the benefits of AI can include performance enhancements, cost control, optimization of processes, shortened products, uh, life cycle development times, and then improved efficiencies. Uh, this, uh, there's also the, the value add of including 24 seven capability of machines to learn through experience. So what we're talking about there is the fact that we now have these machines running, first of all, running 24 seven, as we would have had a bit through our industry 3.0, which is where humans obviously need to rest, eat, take breaks, et cetera. Machines don't, they just repeat the process, repeat the process, repeat the process. When we have AI learning from the machines and the stuff as it goes along, we have that same thing where we have now 24 seven availability of this learning. And that can obviously lead to again, further savings and further enhancements. Uh, in addition, the cost of entry can be very low, again, depending on the complexity of your application. Um, and savings can be then very high as a result of short payback periods. Now, when I say the cost of entry can be very low, it does depend on where you're going with your artificial intelligence. So you could have a small hobbyist little thing that you want to set up in your home. In that case, no problem. You can do that. You need a computer and an internet connection and the time to be willing to invest to learn what you're doing. And that's all you need. You can get free help online. You'll be able to write programs on your computer to do some form of basic machine learning and artificial intelligence. So you can do that, as I said, with a computer and with an internet connection without any costs. However, if you consider um, some bigger features, like for instance, the AI in Google Maps or in Google um, that they're making at the moment, they're way more cars for the, the self driving applications. The AI costs for that are massive because the amount of data they had to collect was a huge amount of data to be able to make valid predictions. So in that respect, then I think it's worth just distinguishing between the two phases of AI that we have. We have the learning phase, which is where you're getting a model and you're training your model with that data. And training the model with that data then um, allows the model to, or the AI system to later on use the operational phase to actually act upon situations created from that model. So what a model is, is it's just the computer making some patterns out of data you fed into it. Um, in the case of the Google AI algorithm, if you imagine um, each time you have been clicking on the, the recapture issue or something like that. So, you know, on websites where you click the I'm not a robot or you, you click on all the fire hydrants or you click on all the, the traffic lights or something like that. Each of these situations, what they're doing is they're allowing more data to be fed to Google's algorithm so that they can know what every single time, what every single instance of a particular um, particular fire hydrant looks like or a particular traffic light looks like. And what that allows them to do then is that allows them to make more valid predictions about an unseen traffic light in the future. So here's a traffic light that the algorithm hasn't seen before, but when it knows the 10 million, 100 billion, whatever it might be, I don't know the actual numbers, but huge amounts of photos that Google has um, processed for what traffic lights are, it can look at it and it can go, well, based on all the photos I've processed previously, yes, that's definitely a traffic light. And then that's how it can know something about these systems. So there is, as I said, a difference between your learning phase and your operational phase. Your learning phase generally requires a lot of computing power and your operational phase is generally something that can work on something a lot smaller. You could generally, um, you can get like kind of two, $3 little microcontrollers that you could in fact run your operational phase on if you so desired. Um, so AI as well changes the way that machine operators perform their jobs and can help to capture knowledge of skilled workers as they transition into retirement. So again, if you imagine uh, technology, every time we, we get a new piece of technology, um, there's always somebody there that isn't happy with this new piece of technology. There's always a slow adoption rate into new technology because as general as humans, we don't like change. 
But then as we start to adopt the new technology, we start to see the benefits of it. And then it becomes normalized. And after a while, we now don't want to work without this technology in place. Well, AI is no different. New generations of workers that come into the industry will start rejecting antiquated process tools and will look towards AI as a secure um, source of job enrichment, uh, notably through uh, robotic processes uh, for automation of uh, repetitive human actions, which we're already slowly starting to do and have been doing for the last number of years anyway. Uh, in effect, AI will represent a new way for humans and machines to work together, to learn about predictive tendencies and to solve complex problems. Uh, so we're saying, for example, uh, AI can help humans with uh, quality inspection, providing them with vision analysis and sound analysis, which is far superior to what humans can do alone. So normally at this point in a presentation, I don't know if you can actually see it here, but I have a guy here behind me, which has been playing behind me, but I'll try and bring it forward now. Um, I'm just trying to show you. I don't know if we can see that. Hang on. Let me just, I'm going to peel it off the back of this. Give me one second. So I have this guy over here, which I think we can probably see now. And if you see that there as I'm talking, you can see that the lights are lighting up differently based on my voice. Um, now, if I, this is hard enough to do in hand, but if I tap it with something deep, you can see here is kind of the, the red lights light up and the green tends to be treble. Oh, I'm sharing screen, so I can't show that to you. Okay, apologies, bear with me for one second. Um, so, there we go. Okay, we can see this a little bit better now. So as I can, as I'm talking, as you can hear, as I said, now this is, this is normally just standing in the background of me as I talk, and the idea is that it will be flashing away the whole time through this presentation. And then at this point, I would just happen to, to talk to you about it. But as I said, obviously a bit different with our recording here. But I'll try and be quiet, and the lights go off. And then, as you can see, as I speak, each of the different lights light up. Now it's difficult enough to make out exactly what lights are on here, but there's three rows. There's a red row for bass, a blue row for mid-range, and a green row for high range. And it just appears that my voice tends to generally light up the blue row as it tends to be um, It's more in the, in the mid-range there. But as you can imagine, and I'm going to try and do this in a second now, as you can imagine, it could be difficult to actually pick out the change in somebody's voice. So if I was to tell you that I'm about to lower my voice down now, and I'm about to lower it down in steps, and if you could tell me how much lower the next step is, so if I drop my voice down to this level, my voice has gone quieter. Or if I drop it down to this level again, it's gone down quieter again. Now, each time I drop down my voice, you might have noticed or recognized that I lowered my voice. But what you won't have known is what percentage I lowered my voice by. Was it 5%? Was it 10%? I mean, maybe somebody could tell me that, but I'd be very surprised. Whereas you'll notice with the system here, it's lighting up a specific number of lights depending on how loud or quiet my voice is. So it knows just from listening to me exactly whether or not I'm doing this. So you can tell then from something like that, that a computer is pretty good at being able to pick out whether or not, you know, exact levels of change. Um, we also have the likes of it, obviously, with a, a, a small webcam here is possibly not the best example of it. But if you imagine uh, photographs you take yourself of something in the distance, if you take a, a photograph with, your, with a modern smartphone and you take a photograph of something in the distance, you, your phone will pick up details that your eyes can't. Um, so that's kind of mainly what I'm getting at there. So I'll just jump back into the, the presentation there again. Um, Share, view, share, um, are we back up? Cool. Okay. So, oh, gone one step forward, am I? Yeah, here we go. So that's what I was saying, basically. Um, as I said, I'm talking about the example here where AI can help humans for quality inspection and provide them with vision and sound analysis far superior to what humans can do. And I was kind of partly demonstrating that there, the fact that our, our, our systems, our computer systems can see things or can do things, notice things that humans simply can't do. And for us, then we can use AI systems to actually process that data, do something with it, and then actually go ahead and figure out a, a good way forward. So again, if we're talking about there, the principles of operation of artificial, um, sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. This is the leaving cert actual quote. So it's the principles of operation and applications of artificial intelligence in smart manufacturing techniques. So 
to kind of then tie those in a little bit. So we've been kind of just looking at the industry revolutions and the smart factory stuff up to now. Let's try and tie that into manufacturing. So manufacturing is one of the main industries that uses the artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies to its fullest potential. Um, smart factories, also known as Industry 4.0, Smart Factory 4.0, there's a couple of different names like that, have all seen major cuts in unexpected downtime um, and better designs of products, as well as improve, um, improved efficiency transition times and overall quality and worker safety have all improved as a result of starting to integrate these things into, into our system. And, and AI is not just one thing. So I'm saying here that AI is at the heart of Industry 4.0, delivering more productivity while staying more environmentally friendly. But it's not just, you know, it's not you have AI or you don't have AI. AI is basically just um, referred to as a group of, as I mentioned at the start, just different machines that can interact with their environment and give a super superficial impression of thinking. So, you know, you can have AI in a system and then again, you know, it might not be great AI or it might be very superior or serious AI as well, depending on, you know, what's implemented. So again, I suppose I want to take away from the idea of thinking, oh yeah, this is AI or this isn't AI. It's just all levels or different amounts of AI included into different systems. So in the manufacturing side of things, then we have uh, Siemens, who are a multinational conglomerate, quite a large one there, um, large manufacturing company in Europe. We have General Electric, an American uh, multinational conglomerate, again, um, including or their sections are aviation, power, renewable energy, digital industries, weapon manufacturing, locomotives, etc. cetera. Um, we have Funk, who are a, a Japanese uh, group of companies, again, into uh, automation and robotics. We have KUKA, who are a German manufacturing um, uh, company who are making again industrial robots and um, factory automation systems. Uh, Bosch, uh, who are a global supplier, again, 401,000 employees uh, globally, and you know, looking at uh, global sales of almost 80 billion euros in 2021. These guys, again, into the mobility solutions, industrial technology, consumer goods, that kind of area of things. Uh, Microsoft, which I'm assuming most people are aware of, another American multinational uh, technology company, and these guys making you know computers and you know, Windows, their most famous product. And then you have NVIDIA who make graphics cards, another American multinational technology company. All of these companies are giants already heavily invested in manufacturing uh, and AI with machine learning approaches to boost every part of their own manufacturing sets. Um, Trendforce, who are a global leader in providing in-depth market intelligence and professional uh, consultation services, estimate the smart factory based, the blend of industry, um, industrial AI and IoT will expand massively in the next three to five years. Admittedly, I don't think any survey was really needed to, to tell that. Not only will they increase massively in the next three to five years, but the five years after that and the five years after that as well. It's just going to continue to grow. Um, in 2015, the number of functioning robots, um, in functioning industrial robots, excuse me, in factories was about 1.6 million. By 2020, that number had grown to 2.7 million, according to the International Federation of Robotics. Now, as you can see, if we were only at 1.6 million in 2015 and only five years later, to be up to 2.7 million. And to be honest, that number would probably be significantly higher now if it wasn't for the pandemic, which definitely put a strain on all the resources and, and kind of slow, slow down the, the advancement of all of these things. But next year, it's it's going to kick off back into gear again and it's going to be ramping up massively so you can see like we're not talking about something new here there's already a significant test case in these different companies uh the global smart smartphone excuse me the global smart manufacturing market size is estimated to be around 589.98 billion dollars uh, by 2028 again i don't know why they decided to go for such a a non-rounded number for 2028. I'm sure they could have estimated $600 billion. But nonetheless, I believe that's done from registering a, a compound annual growth rate of about 12.4% from 21 to 2028, which is what they've been doing up to now. As I said, we will have seen a slowdown in 2021 and 2022. So that number might not quite make it to the 600 billion by 2028, or you'd never know, we might have a good bounce back and it might make it there and further. But nonetheless, it's still a huge amount of money we're talking about and a huge investment in an industry that we're going to have in the near future. So how then can artificial intelligence help in our smart manufacturing? So we have the idea of smart maintenance. Unplanned downtime costs factories in the US upwards of 50 billion annually. 42% of which can be attributed to acid failure, and that's usually down to unplanned downtime. If we can have a planned downtime, um, if we can service things just before they break, if we know when something is going to run into an issue and we can sort it out before fa catastrophic failure happens, then we can have huge savings. So complex AI algorithms then is a set of well-defined steps to arrive at a desired solution, 
like neural networks and machine learning. And these can generate trustworthy predictions regarding the status of assets and machinery. So again, very rudimentary if you think of some sort of a robot arm. And sorry, I'm doing motions again and I've realized you can't see the motions. Um, yeah, I don't want to break the screen for it. If you imagine just um, having a, the robot arm and that arm as it extends and retracts and then extends and then retracts, each time it does that, the arm is adding some sort of wear to the component. If you imagine then the elbow joint of that arm um, was probably manufactured by some company who's given some specifications for how many extensions and retractions with X amount of weight that arm is, is capable of doing. And then the more of those extensions and retractions that are completed, then the, the closer we are to having to replace that particular device. But with a proper AI system in place, you can monitor that, you can watch for it, you can look for strain, you can take the manufacturer's uh, recommendations into account, and then the system can recommend its own upgrade or its own repair before it's actually necessary, preventing catastrophic failure, and depending on your AI systems as well, potentially actually have the ability to have another AI system actually repair the AI systems that are already in place. Um, just then to kind of give a bit more of an idea then of algorithms, so I've mentioned there just above that your algorithm is a set of well-defined steps um, to be followed to arrive at a desired solution. Um, a couple of examples that you might be familiar with are some streaming platforms. So if you think about YouTube, Netflix, uh, Prime, Disney Plus, um, these kind of streaming platforms, all of these platforms recommend stuff to you. So you're on their platform. What they want you to is they want you to have they want to have your attention for as long as possible or as much as possible. They want your attention. And once they have your attention, then they want to keep that attention because the more they can keep your attention, the more they can sell your time to advertisers. So they want to figure out what you're interested in. They want to know how much you like it and then want to keep showing you that sort of content. So as I said, as I'm sure any of you have seen, you start getting recommendations, you know, based on your current um, your current viewing history, we feel this is something you might watch. And, and it gets that information from knowing, well, how often did you click into a new series that it recommended to you? If you clicked in, did you click back out again three minutes later? Did you actually watch the next episode? Did you watch 10 episodes in one sitting? Um, you know, it just takes all of these informations into account, stores it, or it stores it next to your, your user details on, your, on the system for you. And then it can make predictions based on your previous history as to what you've done and to find the best way of presenting you something going forward that you will most like, because if you like it, you're going to stay watching, and then that's what they want to. So better product development then. So we can talk about generative design as a method that allows putting a detailed brief created by humans into an algorithm. So you basically you feed the algorithm with a bunch of different information, such as resources, budget, time, all of these things. And you get the algorithm to process out all the different ways that you can achieve your goal, and then it can narrow down that, that achievement or that, that strategy can narrow it down to one or two good ideas and then present those good ideas for, for maybe humans to decide on which route to take at that point. But it can save humans all the time of going through all the bad ideas or just, just better generally examining situations that aren't very useful. So as I'm saying here, the algorithm examines all possible variations and then generates a few optimum solutions. And then artificial intelligence is almost completely objective without any unproven assumptions unlike humans can have. So that's another problem we're gonna run into as humans. We will have assumptions. And whether we know it or not, we have them. We all have biases, we all have assumptions. We make assumptions day to day as we carry on. And if we've made some sort of an unproven assumption, we could continue to make that and we could go completely down the wrong route without, um, without being able to step forward, whereas our artificial intelligence system shouldn't suffer from that same problem. Um, so quality improvements then. Uh, customers expect impeccable products at the moment, uh, such as product defects cause recalls, massive damages to the reputation of the company and its brand. So what do I mean by that? So just with the way we have been able to supply products and with the testing and basically just uh, quality uh, improvements and insurances that we've had over time. People now just expect, when they get something, they expect it to work, they expect it to work flawlessly, and they expect it to be perfect. With the access that everybody has to social media and other such things, um, they also have a voice if their product isn't perfect, and they can voice opinions on that that product. So companies need to pr produce products that are impeccable. They can't afford to be producing products that have mistakes in them. So I'm saying an AI could alert a company to a problem in the product line that could result in a quality issue. Um, one that stands out in my head is not so long ago, a uh, couple of years now at this stage, uh, Samsung had a particular phone. I don't remember the phone. I think it was the Note 10 or something like that. But the particular phone that they were um, having a problem with, 
the, a few models of this phone got out with issues in the battery. I can't remember exactly what the issues were, but the phone was overheating and sometimes catching fire. Now, Samsung sell a lot of phones and it was one or two that caught fire. So realistically, a tiny, tiny percentage and definitely within a uh, margin of error. But as you can imagine, immediately these um, phones that were catching fire caught the news. And then once they caught the news, they got popular. Everybody was sharing them. And this would have done untold damage to um, Samsung's reputation. Now, luckily, big company that were able to weather that storm and then they were able to kind of correct the issue and, and carry on. But something like that then could cause faults. And I'm saying that these faults then could be major or subtle, but they all have an influence on the overall level of production. And most of them could be eliminated in the early stages if we have AI systems that can go and they can seek them out and try and find these different problems. One of the other areas then that we can find AI helping us in with is when we start to get increased market adaption adaption sorry so once different people take on this ai what you have is the general the different ai systems can now communicate with each other and a good example of this is if you consider um google maps or something like google maps so imagine you are looking at a situation where you are trying to get from and again this is normally where i would point so bear with me i'll try and describe it on the image on the left if you see there's kind of a building in the middle with a v the kind of on roads going to either side of it. If you just imagine if you wanted to go up to the left, let's say there to some building up on the far left in the traffic and you wanted to get there, you could go and you could put it into Google Maps that that's your destination. And Google is gonna show you the route to the left, but it might also show you that if you go to the right and you kind of go around that big building in the middle, that there's another route to get to your destination. And then you'd be wondering, well, why is Google showing me the two routes? I mean, obviously I want to take the shorter route. Well, that's not necessarily true. If you look at this picture a little bit more, you see this picture is a busy city. Traffic could be quite hefty and there might be different reasons as to why maybe it's slower to head up along that road. And you'd be like, well, how, how does Google know about traffic? When, when you're looking at Google Maps and you're actually asking it to give you a destination, how does it know about all the other traffic in the systems around? Well, it turns out you're not the only one with an Android phone. You're not the only one with an Android phone that is willing to share their location in order to be able to get good traffic information. And what happens is all the Android phone users all share their locations. So now Google knows where everyone is um, and they know how many people are on that road. They know what pace those people are traveling at. So they know where the traffic is. They know how fast the traffic is moving. And based on previous history and being able to move forward, they also know what hit traffic is going to be like tomorrow. And based on maybe using weather data and stuff like that, they can tell whether or not there might be a sudden change in the traffic or something like that. So they can not only predict the faster route now, but they can also go ahead then and predict using these connected systems, they can predict the faster route tomorrow or the day after as well. So I'm just saying here then that AI and machine learning are already an essential element of factory 4.0 but they can also improve supply chains, making them interactive to changes in the market beforehand. Um, thus, managers can improve their strategic vision by relying on AI suggestions. Estimates are generated by AI based on linking together a number of factors, such as political situations, weather, consumer behavior, and the status of the economy. Uh, staff inventory then and supply chain, um, supply materials, et cetera, could all be then calculated according to these predictions, and then you can act accordingly. Again, if you imagine a snow plow or something like that, I only want to plow certain parts of the time. Um, cool. So last thing then, I normally have, as I said, a slide in here where I would bring and I would point to the vehicle I have. I'll try and hold it up in a minute to show it to you. But this slide is then kind of just implementing or integrating into that. We're talking about the applications of AI in the automotive industry. And just here, we're saying that artificial intelligence in, um, in manufacturing or in the automotive industry, where AI lends itself perfectly to powering advances in safety features like uh, lane assist and stuff like that. You then have cloud services. So the application of artificial intelligence in cloud platforms ensures that data is available when, when uh, needed. So again, you don't have to have it all stored in your device. You can pull it down from the cloud when necessary. Automotive insurance. So again, AI speeds up the process of filing claims and all that boring stuff. Again, it's the boring stuff we want to get AI to do. So then automotive insurance can be worked out quicker and hopefully cheaper for everybody, which would be better. Um, and then you have car manufacturing. We saw a number of the assembly lines there. But in general, robots are driving the optimization and rethinking the processes of production in innovative new ways, again, using consumer uh, production lines and stuff like that. And then finally, you have um, Drive, uh, driver monitoring. So AI software can detect driver behavior in four key areas. So you have your driver identification, recognition, monitoring, and infotainment control. Um, and as I said, I believe that is, that is the end of the presentation. If you just bear with me one minute, 
I have, um, hang on, I'll end around. I, I suppose I can take questions and maybe during the questions I can possibly present um, bits of the car I was going to show before. So let me just drop this down. Okay, um, so yeah, can we see comments? Yeah, so I don't know, is there anybody, anybody have any questions there? You can shout them at me or type them in the chat or whatever the story might be. So there's not any, yeah, so I'll just grab, so. So just to try and show you some of the stuff then I had kind of previously there mentioned just to show you the flashing lights. As I said, this guy is something that we normally try and present to, to, to show some of the AI stuff. So this is a project that I completed myself uh, here in, in, in LIT and this car itself has sensors up top here. The sensor here, this is a, an LDR or a light dependent resistor. This senses the level of light in the room Makes the, makes the lights turn on automatically. Then there are sensors up here. So this is a, an, a laser sensor up here. So this is a distance sensor. And then there's just some, obviously some driving LEDs and stuff in the front. On the back, there's also another distance sensor there. And an easier way to see those is if I lift off, if I lift off the casing here, you can see there is my, one of my sensors at the back. This, some of the LEDs connected up to the front here. If I bring, this guy back around, sorry, he's heavy enough. So you see in the back there as well, another sensor on the back. And then up on the roof there, you can see, if I can get that up close enough that you can see it, there's a blue, sorry, there's a Bluetooth module up there on the roof. Um, and that Bluetooth module then is what allows you to control the car. And the idea is that this car then, as I said, is somewhat aware of its environment. So if the vehicle is traveling along and if you get in the way of it, it will, it will turn off um, or it will actually, attempt to brake and stop. Now, as you can potentially see from the front of the car, it's a bit scratched up. So my, my algorithms weren't always exactly correct. Uh, sometimes I did crash into walls and such. But again, that's the difference between, you know, having a, a hobbyist, rudimentary, cheap AI system built versus uh, Google with their AI algorithm where they have to have a huge, huge, um, huge amount of safety data put in there to make sure that for every single scenario, the AI will always do the correct thing. Whereas if my AI did the wrong thing here and there, it's fine. You know, nothing not, nothing majorly lost. Um, I could go further into the, the depths of, of how this car runs. There's a number of other sensors on this guy as well. Um, but again, I suppose I'd rather just see if anybody actually has any questions on any of the stuff that we've had so far. No? Okay, well, I'm not sure 